we first have the presentation of monograph by T.M. Narendran. Narendran is a researcher of Indology with a Swadeshi perspective. He is a teacher of Sanskrit Shastras at Mysore and is also concurrently pursuing his own studies in the same field. He studied engineering in Arizona State University and thereafter acquired an MA in Sanskrit from Karnataka Sanskrit uh, Open University. He has also been designated as Infinity Foundation India Research Fellow after his presentation at the first edition of the Swadeshi Indology Conference Series in July 2016. Naren. So the topic of my paper is uh, a Pariksha of Sheldon Pollock's Three-Dimensional Philology. And I'm using the Pramanas of Nyaya Shastra, especially uh, Nyaya Sutra and Nyaya Bhashya, that what has been described Nyaya Sutra and Nyaya Bhashya in evaluating not just the three-dimensional philology, but also the philology, generally the philology of Sheldon Pollock, which is his approach to understanding Indian texts. So the Bharatiya Jnana Parampara can be uh, uh, the Indian knowledge traditions uh, uh, are classified uh, and uh, are classified by these, by these two shlokas, uh, which are found in Vishnu Purana and Yajnavalkya Smriti. They are well-known shlokas. Angani Vedas Chattvaro Mimamsa Nyaya Vistaraha Puranam Dharma Shastrancha Vidya Hetas Chaturdasha, which is found in Vishnu Purana. And these are the six Angas, four Vedas, Nyaya, Mimamsa, Purana and Dharma Shastra. And these are collectively called Vidyasthanas, 14 Vidyasthanas. And similarly, in Yajnavalkya Smriti, Purana, Nyaya, Mimamsa, Dharma Shastra, Anga Mishrita, Vedasthanani Vidyanam, Dharmasya Chaturdasha. So, very same classification is found in Yajnavalkya, said by Yajnavalkya also. But he adds this Shabda called Dharma. So, they are not just Vidyasthanas, but they are also Dharmasthanas, which is very important in Indian context. So, it is not, it is not going to be just science, but science bounded by some kind of dharma, which is different from what the Western paradigm is. Science not bounded by dharma. And this is not unique to just the Hindu traditions. A similar framework can be found in both uh, uh, Buddhist and Jaina works also. So you have the Buddha vachanas or uh, Jaina vachanas, which are revealed sources. Uh, and you have a body of literature to understand uh, such revealed sources. So this kind of having some kind of uh, it can be Vedas, which is Apaurushaya, which we discussed yesterday. Or it can be some kind of Yogi Vachana, Buddha Vachana, Jaina Vachana. <coughs> and the literature that is, uh, comes around to understand that kind of revealed, uh, revealed experiences. And the commonalities of these three traditions can be seen by the fact that Ramayana is found in uh, all these three traditions. There's a lot of, lot of similarities that are there. And also this Nyaya Shastra that is there, which is, I think the oldest text is uh, Nyaya Sutra, Nyaya Bhashya, but it is also used uh, uh, very much by, it has been inspired texts in uh, Jaina traditions and also in uh, Bauddha traditions. So they have used this Nyaya framework uh, to analyze uh, sort of the world around them. So this uh, one among these 14 Vidyasthanas is uh, um, Nyaya, Nyaya Sutra and the commentary Nyaya Sutra which is written by Gautama Maharishi and Vatsyayana Maharishi writes his Nyaya Bhashya on the Nyaya Sutra. And the opening, the, the first paragraph itself of the Nyaya, Nyaya Bhashya has a very profound observation on uh, how Pramanas are used to understand the Arthas or Pramanas used to understand the world around us. So I'll read that paragraph and I'll also read the translation. Pramanato Artha Pratipattau Pravritti Samarthyad Arthavat Pramanam Pramana mantarena na artha pratipati hi, na artha pratipati mantarena pravritti samarthyam. Pramane na kalvayam yata, artha mupalabya tam ipsati jihativa, tasya ipsa jihasa prayuktasya, samiha pravritti rituchate, samarthyam punaha asya asya palena abisam bandaha, samiha manas samiha manaha tam artham abipsan jihasan va, tamartham apnoti jihativa, arthas to sukam sukahe tuscha. Dukkam dukkha hetuscha, soyam pramana arthaha aparisankhya yaha, prana brith bedasya aparisankhya yatvat. So the essence of this is that 
this is this is an observation on all how human activity takes place it is not just limited to some nyaya tradition or indian tradition it is how 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 does one know the world around oneself so it is only through the pramanas one can know the uh, world one can know the arthas or the world around oneself and this is applicable to all all human activity across all time and space so this is going to be applicable to paul shellock's uh, uh, philology also and the translation of this is by the pramanas the artha is comprehended and this results in pravritti samarthya or successful activity therefore pramana is arthavat or always connected with artha so both are always together without pramanas artha cannot be comprehended and without comprehension of artha successful activity does not arise by the pramanas the nyata knower comprehends artha and either desires it or avoids it all the samiha effort of the nyata in desiring or avoiding artha is called pravritti activity samarthya is the capacity of the nyata to achieve phala making an effort in desiring or avoiding an object the nyata either obtains it or avoids it the artha arthas are classified into four sukha reason for sukha dukkha and the reason for dukkha the arthas known through pramanas are uncountable since the number of living beings are also uncountable so this is very very profound and uh, uh, basic observation that uh, nyaya bhashyakara vatsayana das in his uh, bhashya and this is going to be the basis this is going to in fact nyaya shastra is going to be the basis for all other shastras also this is how and every other shastras every other shastra will adopt this pramana shastra pr- pramana uh, uh, this four pramanas and sort of maybe uh, modify it according to their prameyas so there's some some kind of modification will take place but this will be the basis of all all other indian shastras so as far as this how does it, how does this relate to relate to sheldon pollock's philology sheldon pollock's three dimension philology so this prabandha examines the three dimension of philology of sheldon pollock using the conceptual framework of nyaya shastra and the pramanas in particular nyaya bhashya begins with an observation on how one gains knowledge and this is equally applicable to pollock also as will be shown in the following sections he cannot deny the pramas pramanas as denying denying it would essentially deny valid knowledge that he is using pramanas to understand the world around him or to be specific indian the indian sanskrit traditions is clear from reading any of his writings and will be illustrated when defining the four pramanas so <coughs> so polak or anybody belonging to polak school can't deny the pramanas so they they will be using pramanas even though they don't say so i think he mentioned in in one of his works maybe in the language of the gods that indians use uh, pramanas which are loka siddha but he is also using lo- pramanas which are loka siddha so using pramanas to evaluate uh, sheldon pollock's philology would be would be acceptable so using pramanas to evaluate 3d philology since the pramanas are used to evaluate the pura pakshin an objection could be raised regarding the validity of the pramanas moreover since the pramanas have not been established and agreed upon the pura pakshin by the pura pakshin the basis of evaluating pollock's philology using the pramanas could also be questioned so without establishing and agreeing upon the pramanas how is it possible to conduct a vakyartha so we are we are here having a discussion or a debate with uh, sheldon pollock and the question is i mean we have not established the pramanas and we have not uh, agreed upon the pramanas so if that is the case can we can we have actually can we have a discussion with uh, sheldon pollock and this we saw <coughs> yesterday also i mean there was a discussion that was in vakyartha was going on for the last two days there was a discussion that was going on but there was no and there was some conclusion that was that was uh, there was a nirnaya and a conclusion that our scholars came to and all of this was done without establishing the pramanas itself there was no question of establishing the pramanas and there was no need to agree upon the pramanas also because pr- pramanas are loka siddha itself so that is a, a very fundamental observation of uh, uh, nyaya bhashya and that is said in the first vakya itself pramanatah artha pratipatto pramanatah artha pratipatti bhavati katham bhavati nam lokatah eva bhavati yet so this vakya states uh, that artha is comprehended by pramanas and they are dependent on each other without pramanas one cannot comprehend any object whereas this established in the loka itself we can directly perceive all the four pramanas namely pratyaksha anumana upamana and shabda being in the used in the world around us so no child is thought about the pramanas but uses them instinctively similarly in discussions and debates the participants use these pramanas without having established them first so this happens very naturally so the question is if it happens naturally it's a matter of telling or at least the pariksha will be saying whether they are using correct pramanas or incorrect pramanas is it correct pramanas or it is a pramana bhasa incorrect pramanas that are being used by sheldon pollock and his school because we discussed about the loka siddha aspect 
and that is there you can see in all shas in all shastra texts discussion take place without having established the pramanas and most of the sanskrit literature is in the form of some kind of discussion or debate that goes on no pramanas are being uh, established so that just goes to show that uh, that uh, the pramanas are loka siddha so again applying this to this uh, 3d philology the, with, without uh, establishing the pramanas how is it possible to conduct vakyartha therefore it should be clear that discussion with the puropakshin polak in this case would initially be to see if the pramanas are being used correctly and if so to discusses to discuss the issues prameya that is being speculated by him so examining the pramanas for validity would have to be agreed upon by the puropakshin the adherence of three dimension philology or his school or any other school like so whoever it may be in the world that is doing you have to accept the pramanas and the pramana pariksha would be accept and would be uh, proper to see if they are they what the thesis they are establishing is correct or wrong or incorrect and this is called in nyaya shastra this is called sarvatantra siddhanta sarvatantra uh, sarvatantra aviruddha tantre adhikrito artha sarvatantra siddhanta so proved doctor in on the basis of unanimity of all siddhanta or branches of learning is an object not contradicted by any of the other siddhantas and admitted in one's own branch of learning so when something is accepted by everybody and not contradicted by one's own siddhanta it is called sarvatantra siddhanta and this uh, this knowing knowing the artha or knowing the world around us through pramanas is considered sarvatantra siddhanta and this is for all all uh, not just indian traditions for all traditions essentially even west would have to accept this uh. and nyaya bhashya says yatha granaadi indriyani gandadaya indriyartha prativyadini bhutani pramanai arthasya grahanam so this last one is important for us pramanai arthasya gramanam so this acquiring a valid knowledge of artha through the pramanas so this, that would be accepted by all pram, the, uh, all siddhantas all schools of thought so the same thing here um, of course nyaya bhashya clearly states that pramanas as a means of obtaining valid knowledge is acceptable to all siddhantas and this includes the proponents of the three dimension of philology also that polak uses all these pramanas is known by casual reading of his works and will be discussed in the section on four, four pramanas and the four pramanas are defined as pratyaksha anumana upamana shabda pramanani the four pramanas are pratyaksha anumana upamana and shabda vatsyayana discusses the etymological meanings of the four pramanas the word aksha in pratyaksha means indriyas or sense organs in this sutra pratyaksha implies the pramana or the instrumental valid knowledge so it could also refer to the knowledge arising from pratyaksha or objects of pratyaksha itself so when we say pratyaksha it is could be pramana or the knowledge arising from that pramana or the object of pramana itself so in relation to this three dimensional philology so this definition and process of pratyaksha it is to be uh, clearly understood since polak defines philology as making sense of text and the word sense here refers to not not to the three aspects of pratyaksha mentioned above so prama he says making sense of text mean understanding text understanding indian tradition he says but it is not going to be what is there directly especially if starting from the 1985 paper it is not something you just read the ramayana or you read some other text and directly perceive it so it's not going to be pratyaksha pramana he is going to be using he is going to be inferring or using anumana pramana so he is making sense of text doesn't refer to this kind of pratyaksha pramana it is only some kind of inference that he is going to be doing from western sort of sources a definition of pratyaksha indriyartha sanikarshotpannam jnanam avyapadesham avyavichari vyavasayatmakam pratyaksham so here i think uh, we are not so uh, concerned about the definition of pratyaksha pratyaksha changes i think for example tarka sangraha gives a little different definition of pratyaksha but uh, the pratyaksha the, the definition of this the lakshana or definition of these four pramanas are not so important it is more important that the process is there process takes place sir. as far as this uh, 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 philosophy this uh, philology of uh, sheldon polock is concerned uh, so as long as as we accept that something called pratyaksha or anumana upamana or shabda is taking place that is that should be sufficient uh, so as far as uh, polock and his school of thought are concerned pratyaksha pramana is certainly accepted we seeing we see it being used by him in his own writings so you see throughout his writings the pratyaksha pramana is being i mean meaning that he is going to be reading directly for example he read at shloka from uh, ramayana and he is going to be interpreting it uh, so that would be a case of pratyaksha pramana uh, but it is going to change when this aesthetization of power comes later on uh, it's from the 1993 paper ramayana and political imagination there is going to be no pratyaksha pramana that is used uh, it is going to be only, only inferences sir uh, so in the earlier papers on ramayana it will always be it will be interpreting the texts of the shlokas of ramayana itself uh, so in the later papers on uh, um, ramayana especially this 1993 paper so he is not going to be interpreting any of the texts because there is no aesthetization of power directly in the text text itself uh, so he is going to be inferring uh, so this is a case of just uh, reading the text and uh, uh, sort of directly interpreting using pratyaksha pramana to directly interpret it uh, 
So the first mention of Rama, so he's talking about Ravana's boon here, and the translation goes as such. Uh, it was he who long ago in the great forest had practiced asceticism for 10,000 years and unflinchingly offered up his own heads to the self-existent Brahma. It was he who had no longer to fear death in combat with any beings, gods, dhanavas, gandharvas, pishachas, birds, serpents, any beings but men. So I think this is in the Divine King, the paper on Divine King. Huh? So here sort of he is directly reading the text and then interpreting it. So that is the case of so many other examples can be given. I'm just giving one example here. And definition of Anumana is Atha Tatpurokam Trividam Anumanam Puravat Seshavat Samanito Drishtancha. So Anumana is discussed next. Anumana is or inference is preceded by Pratyaksha and is of three types. Puravat, Seshavat and Samanito Drishtancha. Again, this can also be seen, you will be seeing how uh, he is using these three forms of uh, uh, Anumana. But here the important thing to notice, it is preceded by Pratyaksha, which in, in uh, uh, Sheldon Pollock's philology, it won't be preceded by Pratyaksha. It will be only inference from Western sources. Sir. So he's not going to be seeing anything directly in the text itself. For example, the power structures in Vyakarana or as these power structures in Ramayana, they're not going to be directly in, in, in Vyakarana, in Mahabhashya or, or uh, Siddhanta Komadi. These kind of power structures are not, go, not going to be there. Rather. So the inference is, it's, so it's not, his inference is not based on Pratyaksha. It is going to be based on sort of this Western sort of deductive techniques which, which doesn't which you can have inferences without having sort of a pratyaksha. So there's an example, like for example, Puravatta. Puravat means when the effect is inferred from its cause. From the raising cloud, it is inferred that it will rain. So in uh, Pollock's uh, philology, uh, inscriptions and processes are being written by kings and that too in poetry. And thus we should infer power structures from them. So he's inferring because prashastis and uh, uh, inscriptions are being written, that there are some kind of power structures that are being there. But now a careful reading of the inscriptions he is showing as evidence will show that inscriptions themselves will not mention any such power structures. As per the definition, this cannot be anumana since it is without any basis on pratyaksha. So he is inferring that because that inscriptions and inscriptions and prashastis are there, there are some kind of power structures that are there. But then there is no, the inscriptions themselves or the prashastis themselves are not talking about the power structures. He's saying just because it is there that it is there, he's inferring it. But there is no basis in Pratyaksha, it is not there. So again, this is kind of Western kind of detective technique where you don't have Pratyaksha, but you're using detection. Detection means essentially you're inferring from sort of Western sources. And Seshavat is uh, when the cause is inferred from the effect. On perceiving the water of the river as different from uh, what it was before, the fullness of the river and the swiftness of the current, this form of Anumana is to show that it has rained. So it has rained, you see the river and then you sort of infer that it has rained. So again, this is also being used in uh, the philology of Sheldon Pollock. Pollock infers that since Vyakarana works were sponsored by kings, they were written to control society. The effects here are the grammatical text and the cause is inferred to be kings since they were patrons and for the pandits who were writing these texts. But of course, this, is, this doesn't work out because he does not mention many other scholars who wrote Vyakarana texts such as Annambatta or even Panini for that matter, who were not supported by kings. So this Anumana cannot be true for all cases. And Samanito Drishtam. So the perception of an object at some place which was, was, pre, which was previously somewhere else due to its movement. The example here is of the sun, which has the movement that cannot be directly perceived. Therefore, it is inferred that though imperceptible, the sun, imperceptible, the sun has movement. So the sun sort of, you cannot see the movement of the sun, but you can see it has changed place. Therefore, you sort of infer that some kind of movement has taken place. So this kind, you can say, this kind of uh, inference also is used. Uh, but again, it will be a pramana basa. It will not be a pramana. It will be a pramana basa as far as this uh, uh, philology of Pollock is concerned. So this introductory paragraph to the language of the gods could be considered under this category, this Samanito Drishtam. So he is inferring. So we have uh, at the beginning of the first millennium, you have, you have uh, um, this book is an attempt to understand two great movements of transformation in culture and power in pre-modern India. This, so two great movements are being inferred by Sheldon Pollock. The first occurred around the beginning of common era when Sanskrit long a sacred language restricted to religious practice was reinvented as a code for literary and political expression. So this development marked the start of an amazing career that saw Sanskrit liter literary culture spread across most of South Southern Asia from Afghanistan to Java. So since it has spread uh, everywhere, so he is sort of inferring that some kind of uh, something has happened around the first, uh, uh, first of beginning of the common era. Similarly, a second moment occurred around the beginning of the second millennium when local speech forms were 
newly dignified as literary languages and began to challenge sanskrit for the work of poetry and polity and in the end replaced it so this could be considered a, a, a case of uh, the samanya todrishtam uh, but again it will be a pramana bhasha because it will not be based on pratyaksha the texts themselves will not be talking about such things for example he is talking when talking about vernacularization he is talking about this kannada text uh, shabdanu shasanam i think and but the shabdanu shasanam doesn't itself talk about vernacularization so he is just inferring again come inference from western sources and not from uh, within the text there is no there is no pratyaksha base for this kind of inference also in definition of upamana prasiddha sadharmya sadhya sadharam upamanam an object which is known through its similarity to another object to another well known object is upamana and this is very commonly used in uh, in all of his texts and he is going to be uh, commonly re- sort of comparing it to europa to establish many of his theses in this is just one example from the language of the gods in the nexus of poetry and polity we also encounter what is most salient and most neglected for a cross cultural historical analysis of vernacularization this analysis is initiated in chapter 11 where parallels between india and europe in cultural and political regionalization are examined temporal spatial and other synchronies and symmetries abound so this kind of comparison he is doing in all his works also here also he is in the language of the gods also he is doing it but he is also brings in this concept of parallel traditions where which i feel is a way to block this this sort of this kind of comparison so you say he saying this kind of philological development that has taken place is is not been influenced by uh, is parallel the, uh, the philological tradition that has developed in china in india and also uh, europe has a parallel de- development and in this way is trying to avoid upamana i think but anyway he says there, there will be this use of upamana will be there throughout his text also and after upadesha shabda the fourth one is shabda pramana shabda is upadesha of naapta or a trustworthy person ad aapta kolu sakshat krita dharma eta drishtasya arthasya chikya paishaya priyukta upadeshta sakshat karanam arthasya aptihi taya pravartate tyapta rishyaryam nechanam samanam lakshanam so one who has sakshat krita dharma sakshat karanam arthasya aptihi and it's very interesting that vatsayana uh, um, here includes uh, rishi arya mlechanam so essentially anybody who has a, a direct knowledge of an artha and who doesn't falsify it would be considered an artha so it's very vishala uh, definition that has been given by vatsayana vatsayana and um, as will be seen in the section examining the works of pollock he substantiates all his thesis statements from western theories this by itself is not wrong as according to vatsayana an artha can be anyone as long as artha including a western scholar as long as an aptha has direct knowledge and communicates it without falsifying it but substantiating from a western aptha could not be included under the second dimension of the three dimension of philology since it would not be the traditional indian view point so he is going to pro- in his three dimension of philology he is going to propose three dimensions first is historical second is uh, according to tradition and third is the personalist so so if he is going to use in the personalist dimension or plane so he has to substantiate his thesis from within the indian tradition itself he cannot go to a western scholar so using this using western scholar as an aptha for the for substantiating the second uh, dimension will not be acceptable because that that is going outside the indian tradition but even if this is included in the presentist dimension these are only theories and they have not been proved for example to show that shastras were descriptive in the beginning and then became prescriptive he draws from western anthropological theories which have not been proved so strictly speaking as far as pollock pollock's works are concerned shabda is not a pramana as aptha does not have a direct knowledge of the object it has not been established so even even from a, his own personal standpoint so if he is going to establish his theories he establish his uh, his thesis it cannot be from another theory sir the theories are not proved themselves sir and most of his theories are either sociological or anthropological at least i think three of his major theories coming from or coming from anthropological uh, background so even they are only at the, at the theory standpoint they have not been proved itself sir so there is no question of how do you how do, even that cannot be taken as aptha because that aptha he is not he doesn't have he is just proposing his uh, uh, spec, or he is just proposing or speculating but he is not established it all so even in that sense also that that uh, you cannot take that as a shabda pramana also even to establish his own from a, from his own perspective it cannot be a pramana um, <coughs> pariksha of three dimensional philology so okay three dimensions are uh, this uh, uh, historical author's intention aitihasika 
ట్రెడిషనల్ హౌ ద ట్రెడిషన్స్ ఆఫ్ ఇట్సెల్ఫ్ సాంప్రదాయిక ప్రజెంటిస్ట్ వ్యూ ఆఫ్ పాలాక్ స్వేచ్ఛ సో 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 ఇన్ అండర్స్టాండింగ్ ఎనీ టెక్స్ట్ ఈ టెక్స్ దీస్ త్రీ త్రీ ప్లేన్స్ ఆర్ త్రీ డిమెన్షన్స్ హీ సేస్ త్రీ డిమెన్షన్స్ ఆర్ దేర్ వన్ ఈస్ ద వాట్ ద ఫర్ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ యూ టేక్ రామాయణ వాట్ వాట్ ఇట్ ద వాల్మీకి హిమ్సెల్ఫ్ సే అండ్ వాట్ ఇట్ ద ట్రెడిషనల్ కామెంటేటర్స్ సే అండ్ వాట్ హీ ఈస్ సేయింగ్ అది సో ఈ టేక్స్ దీస్ దీస్ ఆర్ ద త్రీ వేస్ ఆఫ్ త్రీ ప్లేన్స్ ఆఫ్ అండర్స్టాండింగ్ ఎ టెక్స్ట్ హీ సేస్ సార్ బట్ అగైన్ విల్ సే ఇన్ అనాలిసిస్ ఆఫ్ దిస్ విల్ షో దట్ ది ప్రజెంటిస్ట్ ఆర్ హిస్ ఓన్ వ్యూ పాయింట్ ఈస్ గోయింగ్ టు టేక్ ద ప్రిడామినెన్స్ అండ్ దిస్ అండ్ వాట్ హీ ఇస్ గోయింగ్ టు బి ఎస్టాబ్లిషింగ్ ఈస్ నాట్ గోయింగ్ టు బి ఫౌండ్ ఇన్ ద టెక్స్ట్ వితౌట్ ప్రత్యక్ష ఈస్ గోయింగ్ టు బి యూజింగ్ ఈస్ ఈ గోయింగ్ బి ఎస్టాబ్లిషింగ్ ఇస్ హిస్ వ్యూ పాయింట్ అండ్ దిస్ ఇస్ గోయింగ్ టు అండ్ హిస్ వ్యూ పాయింట్ ఇస్ ఎస్టాబ్లిష్ బై ఇన్ఫరెన్స్ అండ్ దట్ ఈస్ ఇన్ఫరెన్స్ ఈస్ కమింగ్ ఫ్రమ్ వెస్టర్న్ థియరీస్ అగైన్ సో ఐ జస్ట్ రీడ్ జస్ట్ గివ్ అన్ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ సో దిస్ ఈస్ ద ప్లేన్ త్రీ ద ప్రజెంట్ వ్యూ ఆఫ్ అవర్ సబ్జెక్టివ్ సో దిస్ ఇస్ హౌ హీ అనలైజెస్ రామాయణ రీడింగ్ యాజ్ ప్రజెంట్ ఇస్ అపాన్ ప్లేన్ త్రీ వీ ఎన్కౌంటర్ ద అస్టానిషింగ్ స్పెక్టికల్ ఆఫ్ అన్ ఏన్షియన్ టెక్స్ రీపర్పస్ యాజ్ అన్ యాంటీ ముస్లిం ట్రాక్ బై హిందూ ఫండమెంటలిస్ట్ పాలిటిషియన్స్ విచ్ ఇన్ నైన్టీన్ నైంటీ టూ లెట్ టు ద డిస్ట్రక్షన్ ఆఫ్ అ మాస్ మాస్క్ ఇన్ అయోధ్య రామాస్ ప్యుటేటివ్ బర్త్ ప్లేస్ బ్రాడ్ ద నేషన్ టు నేషన్ స్టేట్ టు బ్రింక్ అ సివిల్ వార్ అండ్ స్టిల్ ప్రొడ్యూసింగ్ సోషల్ అపీవల్ దిస్ ఇస్ కొటేషన్ డైరెక్ట్లీ ఫ్రమ్ హిజ్ వర్క్ సచ్ రీడింగ్ ప్రామిసెస్ టు రిఫ్లెక్ట్ ఆన్ ద ప్రజెన్స్ ఆఫ్ ఫాస్ట్ టెక్స్ ఇన్ కంటెంపరీ ఇన్ ఇండియా on this particular text malleability and availability for repurposing and not the least our object on our objections to via planes 1 and 2 to critically register the history of this malleability and repurposing so already it is very clear I and mean, he is he is taking looking at this uh, ayodhya incident that took place in 1992 and saying that from his own perspective saying that this is coming from the ramayana text itself and therefore ramayana text along the planes 2 and plane plane 1 and plane 2 uh, would have to be political also so from plane 3 from his own standpoint he is taking his own standpoint is that it is a ramayana as a political he is connecting this uh, muslim uh, the, the destruction of babri masjid with the ramayana text uh, specifically uh. so he is saying even when valmiki uh, when he is going to be saying even when valmiki wrote it it is going to be a political text and even when the commentators commented on it it is going to be a political text so it is going to be a political text throughout again the, i think the response to this is uh, without showing any evidence as to how this text was repurposed pollock feels morally obliged to start a project to critically register the history of this malleability and repurposing interpreting ramayana along planes 1 and 2 is the methodology methodology used in carrying out this project thus according to pollock himself in this plane there is no shloka in the ramayana itself that, we, that could be called political so even by his own admission there is nothing of course there is raja dharma that is there in ramayana but there is nothing that is political that is there by his own admission so what what was the intention of valmiki that is the plain one uh, at the time of authorship historical it bears clear impress of ashoka's new quasi buddhist political theology where power takes on a marked and unprecedented unprecedented spiritualized dimension within the specific specific horizon historical horizon the ramayana appears to seek an imaginative answer to profound problem of centrifugal dynamic of power how it is possible to produce a political order that can both acknowledge and transcend the violent constitutive of the political so he is going to be placing it post after or around the time of ashoka and therefore he is going to be saying that some kind of political thing has been uh, sort of uh, ingrained in uh, the ramayana it's at the time of composition itself thus in the first or historical plane two aspects need to be proved ramayana is post ashokan and that it is a political text neither has been proved with sufficient evidence from within the text itself in a sense there is no evidence within the text that lends itself to pratyaksha pramana that ramayana is a political text and is not directly perceived in this historical plane so he has to so show that it is somewhere around or post ashoka but there is nothing within the ramayana itself that that says it is post ashoka so there is there is no no pramana there is no direct pratyaksha pramana here also so in plane 3 also there was no even according to his interpretation there was no pratyaksha pramana to show that it was a political text and even in the plane one also there is no pratyaksha pramana there is nothing within the text itself show it is political and this is how plain two is how the commentators have commented upon it traditional commentators or interpreters i mean you have lot of commentaries on ramayana and how how have they seen this ramayana text such a vision of a text engaged only in the second millennium even if derived from the older political theology it is no longer recognizably such a for these readers medieval theologic theology and commentators the poem is an absolute true record of god's deeds on earth Rama is an avatar of God Vishnu a conviction that made the vernacular versions above all the 16th century Hindi adaptation Rama Charitra Manasa among the most important religious texts of India 
So again, the commentators, again, they are not seeing this as a political text. Either. So they are seeing this as a scriptural text. Either. So here, again, there is no pramana from this standpoint. There is no pratyaksha pramana from this standpoint also. Either. So along all these three planes, uh, so there is nothing, no pratyaksha pramana that is shown to show that Lama, Ramayana is a uh, political text. Uh, only some kind of inferences will be used, which is from the Western tradition itself. Uh. So we'll just go ahead uh, and I, I try to, I've analyzed about four or five works uh, to, uh, of Polak uh, along this, uh, this avayava, uh, pancha avayava uh, categories. Uh. So I'll just show one example. Atha mm. avayavaha. Pratigna yetu hetu udaharana upana upanaya nigamanan avayavaha nigamanani avayavaha. So these uh, five components are avayava, savanyaya, or inference are stated gen- and generally explained. Huh? So you have this pratigna vachana, hetu is there, udaharana, upanayana, nigamana. So pratigna vachana is the thesis statement, hetu is the reason, udaharana is the example, upanayana is application, and nigamana is the conclusion. So you have parvato, vanniman will be the thesis statement, hill has fire. Because of smoke, Dhoom Parvata Vannimaan Dhooma Atta. So, Etra Etra Dhooma Hat Atra Agni Hi. Wherever there is smoke, there is fire. There is smoke in the hill also. Thus, because of the smoke, the hill has fire. So, this is how we sort of establish anything. So, this can be very easily applied to his works also. And I applied, as I said, I applied it to about four or five works. I'll just give one example here. So, in his 1985 paper, The Theory of Practice and Practice of Theory in Indian Intellectual History, so this is the Pratignya Vachana that is there. This is thesis statement. In ancient India, however, there were special factors which we shall examine that contributed to transforming Shastra into a rigorously normative code, enabling it to speak in an injective mode with, with the authority appropriate to Vedic Vidis. The transformation of Shastras from descriptive catalog to prescriptive system. So I have suggested what was I have suggested was a development from descriptive to prescriptive plan. So his thesis statement is that Shastras went from being descriptive to prescriptive. This is a very important thesis for him. So this is his thesis of Pratignya Vachana. So he has to show some reason or hetu for this. So various Shastras are quoted, but there is no Pratyaksha Pramana, nothing within the Sanskrit texts themselves that show, that say that such a transformation occurred. So he is talking about, let's say, for example, Siddhe, Shabdartha, Sambandhi, Lokato, Artha, Prayukte, Shastriya, Dharma, Niyamaha. So Dharma, Niyamaha is some kind of prescriptive code he is saying. But they are not commentators or not Mahabhashakara, that's a Vartika. And Mahabhashakara is not saying this. Dharmanyama is not meant for controlling. And the commentators such as uh, Pradipa, um, Kayata and uh, Kayata and also Nagesha, they are not talking about uh, this kind of transformation that occurred. So he's trying to show transformation that occurred. They are not talking about any such transformation. So he simply states that in the beginning, Shastras such as grammar were descriptive, later on became prescriptive. Thus the hetu to support Pratignya Vachana would have to be questioned. So essentially it would be a hetva basa. I'm not doing any analysis of hetva basa now. I'm just showing that, that pramanas that he is using or the incorrect, incorrect pramanas that he is using. But even we can show hetva basas also in all these things. And the Udahana, of course, you know, it is not coming from uh, any Indian tradition itself. All, in all his texts from 1985 or even the earlier texts also, this kind of is going to be drawing from Western theories only. So here, for here, on a scale probably unparalleled in pre-modern world, we find a thorough, tra- thorough transformation adopting now Greed's well-known dichotomy of models of human activity into models for, whereby texts that initially had shaped themselves to reality so as to make it graspable end by asserting the authority to shape the reality themselves. So this comes some kind of Greek Greed's theory that is there, so where it he is talking about models of which is descriptive and models for which is prescriptive. So he is drawing from that theory and then applying it to Indian tradition. So there, this also means that there is no such thing as a three dimensional philology. In all his works also, the purpose of this, one of the purpose of this doing this is to show that uh, there is no three dimension, there is only one dimension. Uh, third dimension. Uh, so nowhere there is no three dimension philology. Everywhere there will be only just one dimension. All his works. All his works. And Upanayana is such a transformation as stated in the Udaharana above, has occurred in the Shastras also. So you, from Udaharana you go to Upanayana, you are applying it. And the Nigama, Nigamana is therefore because of the Hetu stated above, Shastras have become prescriptive from being descriptive. He is concluding. It is a conclusion. And the Nirnaya is to establish this transformation, he uses Greed's models as Pramana. So the second dimension of his three dimensional philology, how the Indian tradition viewed itself, is not seen here. Using greeds as pramana is not valid since his theories have not been proved and this cannot be called a pramana. 
Thus, there is no three-dimensional philology and only his own interpretation which results in essentially a one-dimensional philology. Uh, moreover, if such a transformation occurred, then it should be asked when it happened. It was very interesting in the 1985 Shastra paper, no dates are given, even in the footnotes. Sir. In language of the God, Julia, everything is based on dates. Sir. dates sir. The chronology is very important for him. Here, no, he's talking about uh, this Vedanta Sri Bhashya, and then he's talking about Mahabhashya, and then he's talking about something else, Dharma Shastra text. But when this transformation occurred, we will not even know. So no dates are given very purposefully, I think. Uh, when, uh, it should be asked when it happened. Did it happen instantaneously or over a period of time? In the paper, Pollock is careful not to mention any dates, even in footnotes. Uh, this should be contrasted with later papers, where dates are conspicuously mentioned, and as they are very important to his thesis. Uh, okay. So I, uh, this is one example, one, one sort of paper I evaluated using these uh, five avayavas. And uh, it gave, at least it gave, gave me a very clear picture of what he is doing. I think that happened, uh, that I didn't have before applying these five avayavas, I didn't have that kind of clarity. So uh, this can be done anywhere he has a thesis statement and is trying to prove something, this can be done. And in the last section, I just did the overall analysis of uh, his, his works, uh, starting with uh, the earliest works. Uh, and called it uh, Intellectual History of Sheldon Pollock, which I term I borrowed from Raja Malhotra. <laughs> I think he mentioned it sometime, I think, Swadesh Indology Conference once, uh, one, first Swadesh Indology Conference. Uh. So we can divide his uh, intellectual history into about five different phases. Uh. So the first phase represents the pre-Orientalism period and includes most of his works on Ramayana. The second phase in responding to Edward Said's criticism beginning, begins with Pollock trying to exhume power and domination within Sanskrit texts themselves. And to this period belongs most of his works on Shastra and Mimamsa in particular. The third phase begins in 1993 with what he calls the poetry of power, seeing Kavya compositions as, exercise, as exercising political power. Fourth phase begins with the study of Rasa in the late 90s. The last phase is represented in his works on philology and his efforts trying to formulate a, a theory for interpreting Sanskrit texts. Uh, some of his works are also in direct reaction, some of his works are also in direct reaction to events taking place in India. But these five phases can also be divi divided in, from the Pravana perspective. So initial, the first phase would be essentially uh, Pratyaksha, based on Pratyaksha Pramana. Second phase uh, would going to, is going to be inferential evidence is going to be showing. Nothing, no Pratyaksha Pramana is going to be shown there, there. Second phase and third phase. Uh, um, and the fourth phase also is very similar, but, but post Rasa is very interesting thing I found, which I need to confirm also. Uh, but, but his own style, when he, after 1998, uh, his translation and introduction to Boja's uh, Sringara, part of Boja's Sringara Prakasha is published. Uh, so after that, his own style changes. Uh, and he becomes, you know, before, pre, before uh, doing the translation, it's fairly dry, it's very difficult to read. Uh, and post, after he does this translation of uh, this first part of uh, Boja Sringara Prakasha, he is, himself is influenced by uh, that style and starts using a lot of these adjectives and uh, it becomes much more readable. <laughs> and, uh, and the language of the gods is also based, uh, I, I think, uh, and I have to, again, I have to confirm this, um, is based on this rasa utpatti that, is, that needs to happen. His definition, making sense of text, which is seen from 2009, <laughs> Sense here is actually rasa utpatti, that is, he is trying to get, you get the feel that the certain things are there, certain power structures are there. So I think he is adopting uh, this uh, Bhoja's rasa itself uh, and trying to, so which shows to say that Sanskrit texts are still alive and they can still, you know, make history. Uh, so, <coughs> he's, I mean, he says Sanskrit died in 1800, Sanskrit was dead in 1000 years ago and then Sanskrit died. 1800 Sanskrit is died in 2003, uh, so all these things are there. But as far as he is concerned, it's still alive, you know. And then it has that capacity to make history. That's very important. Uh, but that I need to do a little more work to show that, you know, sort of. Otherwise, I'll become like if I don't show pramanas, I'll become like Folak himself. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I'll just just run through. I mean, um, other these are all all the um, more details and whatever I have discussed so far. Um, I think this, all our tradition, as we saw yesterday with our scholars, all these traditions are very much uh, living today. It is not uh, something that is gone or something that is dead. And it is still has that capacity to, I think, respond. Uh, um, the text I used primarily was this Nyaya Darshana by Mahamahapadhyaya Panibhushna Tarkavagisha, which was written in Bengali, which is a very brilliant text. Uh, and it has been translated uh, or at least summarized. Uh, and my own guru, Pandit Ratna K.S. Varadacharya, and he always used to emphasize the importance of uh, uh, 
ന്യായ ശാസ്ത്ര ദിസ് ന്യായ സൂത്ര ന്യായ ഭാഷ ഓൾവേസ് യൂസ് ടു ടെൽ എസ് ദ പ്രൊഫൗണ്ടിറ്റി ഓഫ് ന്യായ സൂത്ര ന്യായ ഭാഷ ആൻഡ് ഐ ഹാവ് ടു സേ ഇഫ് ഐ ഹഡ് നോട്ട് ആൻഡ് കോസ് വി ദറ്റ്സ് വാസ് അപ്തു ഉപദേശ യു നോ ഈ സെറ്റ് ദിസ് ആൻഡ് വി ലിസൺ ടു ഹിം ബട്ട് ഇഫ് ഐ ഹഡ് നോട്ട് ഡൺ ദിസ് യു നോ ട്രൈ ടു അപ്ലൈ ദിസ് ന്യായ ഫ്രെയിം വർക്ക് ടു വർക്ക്സ് ഓഫ് ഷെൽഡൻ പോലോ ഐ ഡോൺ തിങ്ക് ഐ വുഡ് ഹവ് സോ ഐ അണ്ടർസ്റ്റുഡ് റിയലി ദ പ്രൊഫൗണ്ടിറ്റി ഓഫ് ദിസ് ദിസ് ടെക്സ്റ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഐ തിങ്ക് ഫോർ ദിസ് ഐ ഹാവ് ടു യു നോ താങ്ക് പ്രൊഫസർ കണ്ണൻ ഹു ആക്ച്വലി ഐ തിങ്ക് വെൻ വി ആർ ടേക്കിംഗ് എ കോഴ്സ് വർക്ക് അബൌട്ട് ത്രീ ഇയർസ് അഗോ നീ ഓൾവേസ് റിപ്പീറ്റഡ്ലി ടോൾ ഡസ്റ്റ് ദ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻസ് ഓഫ് സോർട്ട് ഓഫ് അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡിങ് what is going on around the world around us what is going on in western indology and how to respond to it and of course we had uh, i think very great experience in the first uh, uh, indology conference in uh, in chennai last year and that was uh, uh, that really opened you know reading uh, raju malhotra's uh, battle of sanskrit and sort of having uh, listening to him and being exposed to what uh, he, he has been doing for the last the great uh, work he has been doing for the last 20 years uh, so that gave us a really uh, um, overall picture of what is going on otherwise i think i would not have realized it so we'll just conclude by reading this very profound uh, this very beautiful statement by vachas mishra in nyaya vartika tatparya tika parama karani ko hi bhagavan muni hi jagadeva dukkha panka magnam uddidir shuh shastram pranitavan tatra yadi kaschin na kaschin na pravartayata kimayatam shastrasya ന ച അനധികൃത പുരുഷ വ്യുത്പാദനേന അസ് തപോ നിധേ കഷ്ടസ്ഥി ദോഷ സോ പരമകാരുണിക ഈ ഭഗവാൻ ആൾ അവർ മുനീശ്വർ ലൈക്ക് ദാറ്റ് അത് ഐ തിങ്ക് അവർ വിദ്വാൻസ് ഓൾസോ മെൻഷൻ ദാറ്റ് എസ് ടഡേ ഭഗവാൻ ജഗദേവ ദുഃഖപങ്കമഗ്നാം ഉദ്ദിദീർഷു ദേ ആർ സോട്ട് ഓഫ് ഇമ്മേഴ്സ്ഡ് ഇൻ ദിസ് ദുഃഖ് ദ വേൾഡ് ഇസ് ഇമ്മേഴ്സ്ഡ് വേൾഡ് ലൈക്ക് ഷെൽഡൻ പോലാപ്പ് യു കെൻ സേ ഈ സോട്ട് ഓഫ് ഇമ്മേഴ്സ്ഡ് ഇൻ ദിസ് ദുഃഖ കൺഫ്യൂസ്ഡ് സോ ടു സോട്ട് ഓഫ് ബ്രിങ് ദ മൗട്ട് ഹി ഹാസ് റിട്ടൺ ദ ശാസ്ത്ര തത്ര ഇതി കഷ്ടൻ ന പ്രവർത്തേത സോ സംബഡി ഡസൻ റീഡ് ദ ശാസ്ത്ര what is it's not the fault of the shastra itself kimayatam shastrasya nacha anadikrita purusha vyutpadanena asya taponidi he kashya dosha so we cannot blame this on gautama maharishi or vatsyayana maharishi when nobody is sort of uh, studying this or uh, uh, understanding this shastra so pradeepa sarva i'll conclude with the shloka pradeepa sarva vidyanam upaya sarva karmanam aashraya sarva dharmanam vidyo deshe prakirtita am sarve krishna arpanam astu first of all congratulations for a very uh, original insight i think uh, the, taking his uh, ba- basic methodology and critiquing that mm-hmm. very so my uh, uh, i would say just repeating your conclusion and then i'll make a comment he claims and this is true in not just his three dimensional philology but all over the place he claims he is doing something which is a deception because he is not doing it so he wants to claim that he is not like the colonizers who were overriding the traditional view he in fact is helping us because he is the last pandit as he has said he is the last pandit mm-hmm. sanskrit is dead and he is the last pandit so he is actually doing us a favor by educating us on what the tradition really said what the histor- the author really said and what the tradition really said mm. because sanskrit is dead so he has to come and do it mm. and then third dimension is his own view okay now what you have shown is actually he is projecting his own interpretation upon valmiki and what he alleges valmiki to have said actually it is pollock saying it but uh, trying to make it look like valmiki said it mm. then the second dimension is what have the historical uh, commentators said again he's saying i'm doing i'm i'm really bringing back the voice original voice and all that and on and all these uh, events eight times in a, eight years in a row the literary festival in jaipur have invited him and this is how he introduced introduced that he is the original voice and when you hear him you can almost hear valmiki and you know all of that and he's so sure he is so confidently saying i am actually the voice of the authentic voice of the tradition mm-hmm. now and you have shown very convincingly that only the third dimension which is pollock's interpretation is there and uh, he is uh, putting it in the mouth of valmiki and putting it in the mouth of the tradition mm-hmm. so actually it is dishonesty mm-hmm. if you think about it mm-hmm. now i have a question for you suppose he was honest and suppose he said first i'll tell you what valmiki says and he would were to do it honestly suppose and then he said this is what the commentators have said and suppose he did that honestly now suppose he were to say i disagree with them i'm not going to pretend that i'm interpreting i'm uh, reviving them i'm going to tell you that they were wrong 
I am going to tell you what is actually going on because they didn't get it right and I, am, uh, I have a right to reinterpret. Now, if he were to do that, I would actually say he's being honest. Would you agree? That, okay. that way he's being honest. And in our own tradition, we have people who come and topple the previous guy, the, who, who, who refute the previous interpretation. We have. So Pollock, Pollock, I asked him when I had, we had a lot of coffee sessions, you know, and he did not want to go on camera, but we had private sessions, very friendly. So I said, aren't you creating a real Siddhant, your Pollock Siddhant? while saying you are interpreting the tradition and he doesn't like to hear that. He says, I stay away from any Pollock Siddhant because I am really telling you what is the authentic tradition. So my feeling is that the real issue with Pollock is a kind of dishonesty because he doesn't want to admit that he's like the colonizers, but this is a colonizer disguised as the tradition. Mm -hmm. So he's more sneaky. Would you agree mm -hmm. with that? Yes, yes. Yeah. But what if he had come and said, I, I, I am honest, this is what Valmiki said, this is what all the uh, commentators said. But I want to tell you that it actually had to do with power, with oppression, nothing sacred about it. What would be your response if he said that? No, the pre-1995 papers on Ramayana, all of them are pre, they published later, but all of them are older, before 1985, before this Shastra paper starts. So they are all, that is what you, what you would say would apply to those things. So he's interpreting the text sir, and saying something where we can differ with the interpretations. Sir. So after that, then he is doing all, all these things. Uh, um. I think what happens, you have to see, what happens is, Edward Said uh. criticizes Orientalism right. Right. for doing these things. Right. So he then wants to supersede that. He cannot right. be one of the Orientalists. Right. Right. He has to therefore reject the Orientalists and say right. that I am right. actually bringing back the original. Right. So I am the now we are calling him new orientalist mm. he would call himself post orientalist but we are saying you are just a new orientalist right, only yes, yes, yes. so that is really what's going on here mm. we are saying that he is an orientalist exactly like the kind of people he's denying and rejecting but he's mm. just one of them mm. he's just a new variety because he's smarter than them mm. yeah and when i started reading this uh, three dimensional philology for uh, si1 i took it as face value huh. so i thought he was going to Seriously, he's going to talk about Valmiki's viewpoint, traditional viewpoint and his own viewpoint. Yeah. Only after doing this, uh, then you, re you realize it is not so. It's only, it's only his viewpoint that is being... Uh, so the real challenge for our movement is that 99% of the, our people have bought into this view that he represents the tradition. Yes. yes. Um, yes. You talk to Murthy, he will say, no, 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 we have to be so happy he's bringing our tradition back. Rohan Murthy says, what a great pleasure I have because now I can imagine Valmiki is speaking. Yes, yes. And all his texts are being received this way because they are being packaged this way. So mm -hmm. your puncturing his 3D is very, very strategic mm -hmm. because this applies to his whole translation methodology. All mm -hmm. the translation methodology says, we will put in new context, our own Western context, but we will sneak it in and say this is what the original author said. Yes, yes, correct. So it's a fraud kind of thing. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Thank you. Yes. I am just trying to supplement what he has said. But there is a different view also we have to take. He was talking about Vidyasthana and Dharmasthana. Vidyasthana is where education is important. Dharmasthana is court, law court, where Pratyaksha Pramana is not the most important one, what they call it as Lekha Pramana. Written evidence is given the foremost importance, number one. Then it is the Dharma Sastra which deals with written documents. And that should be taken into consideration by the court when he gives the judgment. The second Pramana is what is called Sakshi. And Pratyaksha Pramana will come under that Sakshi probably, most probably. So, when there is a Lekha Pramana and then also a Sakshi. And then the third one is uh, what you call a, a <coughs> Bhoga or Bhukti, enjoyment, possession in law. Uh, that is given the third Pramana. And the, the last fourth Pramana is Daivika. Daivika is uh, you have to insert your hand that I am not a uh, culprit and in a boiling oil and so on. This is type of called daiva that we are not concerned. But the, we are concerned with uh, what you call lekha pramana. 
and sakshi and also bhukti these three yeah so uh, so lekhya pramana when there is lekhya pramana and when there is sakshi and then then bhukti the dharma shastra is very clear you have to give importance only to written document this is what is mentioned in uh, dharma shastra all dharma shastra so dharma shastra have been in active use till up to 18th century and all the decisions taken in the court were all based on these uh, lekhya pramanas given in dharma shastra and so sanskrit was living right up to 18th century in all law court and we have thousands and thousands and thousands of inscriptions all these inscriptions are court document to be produced in times of uh, dispute so here what we are talking about pratyaksha pramana and uh, anumana and uh, Uh, this thing the all related to written uh, kavyas probably they don't even worry about a written kavya but just they said only about kavya and so pramana is as a word used as evidence in law court so that also we have to take into consideration uh, just uh, two editions for our pivotal paper and the two corrections uh, two or three corrections initially when you say this there is a very popular verse in vakyapadiyam quoted by shankaracharya in his brahma sutra bhashyam under tarka pratishthanat there itself shankaracharya says pratishthita tarka pramanam the verse of shri bhartruhari is about this anumana not done and never depend totally on anumana yatne na anumito pyartha kushalaih anumatrubhi abhiyukta taraih anyaih anyathaiva upajyate if a better i mean a more um, a powerful uh, nayayika comes he may prove it otherwise quite opposite to your so tarka cannot be depended upon this is taken by shankaracharya in vachanam and bhavati in verse in verse form do you quote that also in your uh, this the second thing is uh, when uh, you said uh, this udaharanam uh, then you have given panchavaya va mahavakyam that is nyaya maha parartanam it is called pratigna hetu udaharano apane nikamanan yavaya va that is the sutram therefore udaharana you did not give example that mahanasah in tarka sangraha also mahanasah is there you said simply whichever has got uh, smoke has got fire like that yatha mahanasah uh, that please add one more thing and shabda pramanam what you can do is in shabda pramanam apto shabda pramanam here but patanjali in charaka sutram gives a different and more beautiful this thing ragadivashad api yaha nanyathavadi saha aptah i may have a love or hatred against a particular person but i never i mean go out of the fact i will tell the fact only he is aptah and that is thing charaka sutra uh, uh, no, no no this is from uh, charaka sutram of patanjali okay. available in manjusha vyakarana mm-hmm. siddhanta manjusha mm-hmm. and the, the other thing is uh, yes you said in uh, mahabhashyam uh, that the uh, interpretation you have given is not uh, quite right siddhe shabdartha sambandhe lokatah lokatah artha pryukte shastrena dharma niyamah kriyate is vartikam you are right mm-hmm. but dharma janiyamah dharma niyamah dharma artho va dharma niyamah patanjali gosan when shabdas are available avikak shabdas from usage and vaidika shabdas from vedas why vyakaranam is the question hmm. then dharma ji niyamah if you employ perfect words that are acceptable to vyakarana you will get punya dharma or punyam and that leads to moksha uh, if you employ adha apashabdas you will get adharma that is the very use and abuse of language is the subject matter of vyakaranam more things i will discuss very nice paper thank you